Welcome. Sure. Thanks, Renee. Um, yes, I am going to talk about eating disorders today. I am. Um, I have a little bit of the overlap with marriage and family therapy background and experience working with um, kids and MST, uh, which incidentally transferred nicely over into working with adolescents with eating disorders, as there are many similar components. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in higher levels of care working with adolescents in um, outpatient IOP and partial hospitalization at uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus. And uh, I kind of came back to my hometown in Worcester. So I'm now working with the providers in Northeast Ohio and Akron Children's and the EMILY program specific to eating disorders. Um, and I do a little bit of teaching on the side here and there at Akron and Ohio State as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about this topic because I think if you haven't really had a chance to dive into, into eating disorders, then um, it's just really compelling, very interesting with all the medical complexities. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks. And you are okay to screen share. All right. All right. Is everything look all right? Don't see anything yet. Okay. You'll just have to re-click that green arrow that says share screen and then select your slides again. Oh. That looks, looks great. It looks great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about eating disorders today. I'm gonna take um, kind of a zoom out general idea and understanding of eating disorders the psychological and medical complexities, and then uh, zero in a little on adolescent treatment and what the family systems component looks like. So um, yeah, I won't go through all of the eating disorder diagnostics and criteria for you, um, but there are basically a few general types of eating disorders. Uh, and these are different than disordered eating which are behaviors that um, can cause difficulty, but don't impair, don't meet diagnostic criteria or impair functioning um, as those you see here will. So uh, there's anorexia, the most commonly known, but, but honestly uh, has the lowest prevalence rate. And I will be talking specifically about severe restrictive eating disorders today. Um, you know, so this is a restrictive eating that causes weight loss past a level of health that causes an individual to have these symptoms of malnutrition. Um, bulimia can cause the same, though there is an additional um, component of the compensatory behaviors, and especially with regard to increased severity of heart struggles with regard to uh, purging or use of laxatives. Um, binge eating disorder has recently been added to the DSM diagnostically. And this is, uh, you know, more and more well-known now, more research, more information that we have. Uh, and this involves uh, overeating, loss of control, um, feelings of guilt and shame. There can be a uh, restrict binge cycle where individuals try to, during the day, restrict their food intake but then they end up compensating for those calories at the end of the day. And then with the guilt and shame, they try to restrict the next day. So it's kind of an, an endless cycle of um, binge restrict, restrict binge. And then there are a whole host of other eating disorders. If you guys had five hours, I would love to share all of these with you, but there are FIDS, so restrictive and avoidant intake disorder, um, often diagnosed in kids. Um, there are a lot of pho phobias associated with eating disorders where um, people are afraid of choking or they're afraid of vomiting and thus uh, restrict their intake significantly that causes a great deal of distress. Most individuals do fall in a continuum of eating disorders uh, and eating behaviors over the lifetime. Uh, and uh, I would I always caution people from trying to diagnose based on body size um, because you can't tell if someone is restricting and in a very serious place just by body size or type or BMI. Um, 
uh, something that has been um, surprising to me to see people hospitalized who were characteristically in the 90th percentile for weight and height and are hospitalized at the 50th percentile. So the normal level um, causes so much distress and strain on their bodies that they become hospitalized. I will also um, state that I'm going to be talking about restrictive eating and behaviors and that, that might be triggering for some. So, um, you know, kind of use your discretion at your involvement in different parts of this talk. Um, I do not have triggering pictures and images. So, and there are a couple um, trends in eating disorder field, including this, this uh, term orthorexia, which is not a diagnostic term, but is a term coined by um, a male physician who felt like he had this kind of um, idealistic view of eating clean foods and healthy and organic that, that occurred, that caused the same effects of anorexia uh, clinically, but was not at all related to fear of weight gain or body image uh, distortion or dysmorphia. Um, and that tends to be a less stigmatized way for people to introduce the idea that they might be restricting or for families often presenting with like, it's not really not an eating disorder. It's more all about health. Um, the effects really are the same and the treatment is the same, uh, but you might hear that being thrown around and that's not a, a, a real clinical term that we use uh, uh, medically in the medical field. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Minnesota starvation experiment. I'm really gonna focus here on anorexia. When we talk about systemic treatment with family involvement for adolescents, um, we really, anorexia is really where we have a significant medical need to have the family involved uh, every step of the way. And it's a very difficult treatment for families to, um, to maintain. So I did wanna talk a little bit about the, the long-term effects of anorexia, um, bulimia, binge eating disorder, a lot of heart problems, um, hormonal and reproductive problems, low bone density or osteopenia, especially for teens and adolescents. Um, there's a lot of risk of injury, um, a lot of uh, bone uh, fractures and partial fractures, and uh, um, a lot of fainting. The biggest risk if you have a uh, restrictive eating disorder is actually a head injury due to fainting. This happens for a lot of clients in the shower uh, when they're uh, standing up. So they also have orthostatic hypotension where they tend to faint with changes um, from going from laying to sitting to standing. Um, and so this is a, kind of one of the biggest risks. Uh, there are also medical complications of a GI system and that kind of further caused difficulty in recognizing an eating disorder. A lot of our teens in the clinic would come to us after already working with, um, uh, with their doctors with um, hairline fractures. They'd already been to GI uh, working um, with those doctors there on uh, you know, allergy testing for food allergies that all come back negative. And oftentimes are, are struggling, you know, not having periods, the females, and they are uh, struggling um, hormonally. So uh, there are a lot of significant medical effects of restrictive eating. And there are just as many long-term effects of binge eating disorder on the other end of the spectrum. Um, obesity and the associated health-related problems, risks of cancer, heart disease. You can see these here. There's also a level of financial distress that's caused by binge eating that we don't see with other disorders because there is a kind of lack of control over spending on food and overeating. Um, and this causes distress in relationships as well, all of these two. Uh, and then both have a high co-occurrence of other mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, OCD are um, among the highest. What I really wanna talk about that's really compelling is what we know about the effect of starvation and malnutrition on the brain. Um, so Ansel Keys in um, at the end of World War II did a starvation experiment and he recruited healthy, psychologically and medically screened healthy adult single men. 
and uh, they stayed on campus um, and were monitors, monitored pretty significantly at the University of Minnesota. Um, and the goal was to kind of mirror the weight loss and the malnutrition scene um, in World War II with our Holocaust survivors and um, the difficulties of the refeeding that we were starting to see um, globally. So they had four phases of the experiment. One was a 12 week control where they just monitored everything medically and psychologically while um, participants kind of continued eating as normal. Then they had a 24 week semi-starvation period, which with 1500 calories, if you do look at images, these men were emaciated. Um, and this is, uh, I have a lot of women tell me the 2000 calorie diet is for, for men and not women. Um, this is some evidence against that. They were very severely restricted and um, uh, you can look that up if you'd like. Some really provocative, interesting um, research came from this. So they started rehabilitating their food for 12 weeks where they, they had four different control groups. It's really not important for what I'm going to share here, but they, they allowed them to eat two to 3000 calories. And then this last eight week group was unrestricted and they ate as normal and they were followed throughout this entire experiment. And then, and for years after. So what is interesting and fascinating here is that in the absence of the pre-existing mental health conditions, nearly all of the men experienced uh, severe emotional distress, um, depression, anxiety, obsessiveness. They were preoccupied with food, exercise with their bodies. Um, they developed a lot of uh, eating rituals, which we see commonly with eating disorders where you eat in a certain order at certain times um, with certain utensils. Uh, in a certain seat, there's overuse of condiments or they overheated or overcooled their food. Um, so a lot of really kind of bizarre uh, food and eating rituals. Um, all had social isolation and withdrawal from others, decreased sexual drive, um, and, uh, and some experienced um, uh, hallucinations and paranoia as well. Uh, so what we found was that, not we, this was not me, but what we know now from this is that obsessive behaviors may, may sometimes lead to eating disorders, but the effect of malnutrition actually perpetuates the spiral and the continuation of all of the symptoms uh, and makes it incredibly difficult to, uh, to, to stop and reverse weight loss and regain emotional health. Um, and that recovery actually depends on nourishment and not just for a week, several weeks or a month or several months, but normally to refeeding uh, restoration of previous weight and oftentimes beyond, especially beyond for adolescents when the, the weight is still a moving target. So this is a big deal. So we know now that, that there are significant psychological effects as well as medical, of malnutrition, of not eating enough. And the time at which it you, the time period that kind of causes the flip or the switch is kind of like, um, is dependent on each different person. You can't say when they'll be triggered uh, and anything can trigger. And, you know, this was a, a clearly um, controlled experiment, but Restrictive eating disorders can be triggered uh, by seemingly small, innocuous life issues. Um, the obesity healthcare lecture, restricting desserts at food can cause to increase control and continuing to restrict um, on and on. So uh, at any point in time, this uh, switch can be flipped that restarts the spiral of anxiety and obsessiveness. And so there's a big myth, especially with restrictive eating disorders, that they are really, really body image focused. It's all kind of this, this issue of vanity um, and also or that they're attention seeking. And and what's um, really upsetting is that they're really not those it's very severe. When I talk about restrictive eating, 
and anorexia, I like to link to OCD. It is very much an avoidant, obsessive compulsive behavior. Um, and there is a, an extremely high amount of anxiety, uh, obviously then that is perpetuated by, by the malnutrition to the brain. Um, and it is uh, the number two cause of death, second uh, only to opioid, op opioid overdose. Um, so it really is a big deal there. And there are so many comorbidities as well. Um, so anxiety disorders, OCD, perfectionism, this is really common. And this is important for the discussion of treatment. A lot of individuals who have anorexia tend to be perfectionist uh, people pleasers they tend to, their parents tend to not have needed uh, any kind of harsh or structured uh, discipline approaches previous to having um, treatment. And, uh, and that causes a lot of distress for parents, it's a totally different type of treatment. Um, so yeah, a lot of trauma, um, alcohol, substance use, anxiety disorders. A lot of major depression and self-harm is very common. There's a great deal of shame associated with eating disorders uh, that results in, in uh, self-harm in many different ways. So I want to talk a little bit about um, treatment. So um, I, I missed the slide here. Here we go. Okay, so treatment for eating disorders. So what I'm going to focus on is this uh, central one here, family-based therapy for anorexia, the Maudsley method. Um, this is the adolescent, the keystone of adolescent treatment for eating disorders. This is uh, similar to MST, where we put the parents in the driver's seat until our kiddo shows us that they're able to um, manage their eating appropriately. Um, and this is a treatment that was developed at, in um, England at the Maudsley Hospital. It's often referred to as Maudsley. The idea behind it is that the parents take control back and the, the individuals with anorexia have almost always have low to no insight. They are so stuck in that obsessive piece that there is low to no insight that this is a problem, even when they're hospital, even in the hospital, like, oh, okay, but I'm breathing fine. Um, so, you know, but I didn't die. It's not that I'm not that sick. Um, so there's low insight and there is no motivation. They don't want to gain weight. They're afraid of gaining weight. They have an intense fear of gaining weight. And that happens by eating more food. They have an extreme amount of body dysmorphia as well. So they actually believe that they are overweight. This is one of the most compelling pieces that an individual can be underweight and we can, as providers, can so clearly see that this is the case and they don't. They absolutely believe that they're overweight. This is a very real thing um, that can be kind of shocking for families. So they are, um, they've got this body dysmorphia, no insight and motivation. And so we end up doing what, what some would consider forced eating. They're not gonna do it on their own. We know that the swiftest uh, weight re restoration leads to the best recovery um, results. And so kind of waiting for an adolescent to have insight and to understand and be agreeable to eating is just not clinically appropriate. So there is a very quick, swift process by which parents, we put parents back in control um, and help them manage their child's anxiety or, or kind of sit through their child's anxiety while they're refeeding. Um, and so these are parents, and so eating disorders, are kind of tough and that the anxiety is so high that these adolescents resort to lying, hiding food, um, finding when, when forced to eat, they'll find ways to compensate. Um, the distress is so real that they might wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and be compelled to do, to over-exercise and do push-ups. And they're crying, tears 
they don't, it's, it's distressing. It's unwanted. They're intrusive thoughts and the compulsions are really intense. So, um, so it's really tricky for parents to be able to manage all of the, the nutritional intake, which normally is like five times higher than what we would assume their needs are. Uh, and there's something called, um, uh, they go into this hyper metabolic state where once they start refeeding their systems working so hard, they're actually losing weight, even though they're eating so much more and you have to like work past that stage. But parents are um, really struggle with this because they have to assume that they're typically um, high performing, high achieving, people pleasing, um, pleasant child is, is being dishonest. And um, everything, you know, food gets hidden in boots, um, sweatshirts on shelves behind them. Everything needs to be in visual sight. They have to, they have to go to the restroom with their child or not allow them to for 30 minutes after meals to prevent purging. Um, sometimes we have to take doors off bedrooms because that, that intensity is so high, the compulsion of the behaviors. Um, and there's not a lot of support for parents uh, who are dealing with refeeding with anorexia. So I typically recommend a few books. I have a book list um, written by other parents who have already gone through the process so that my parents don't feel so alone. And I do connect them with resources with other parents who've, who've been through the process they can sit down and have coffee with. Um, medication management wise. Uh, so a lot of, I, I don't, I'm not a prescriber, but I'll share that a lot of um, medications for eating disorders are, are SSRIs. Prozac is the big one kind of across the board. Um, and then we kind of look more at the anxiolytics and um, some benzodiazepines to help when weight is incredibly low and we need help getting through meals, which is meant to be used temporarily. Um, and, and some providers are more or less comfortable with that approach. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so parents involved, we get schools involved often. We have to get IEPs or have supervised lunches where people know the rules. Um, we educate fa ex like expanded families um, and babysitters on what to say, not say. Um, a lot of people try to help in ways that actually cause more distress for our kiddos and their families. And so kind of they become kind of control, control the environment to prevent triggers. Um, and we typically stop um, with anorexia, we'll stop exercise and activity other than relaxation activities like yoga, stretching, and breathing yoga for movement um, because that interferes with the ability to refeed um, and, and restore weight. There are, you know, so, so primary interventions, we food track, we do in-session weights, um, which is actually a controversial topic and a lot of treatment centers don't do, you know, really weigh clients in person. One of the things that is often the case is that our clients are afraid of the numbers and we need to do thought challenging around an exposure, around the numbers and what they really mean. And so we do that in session and also prevents relapse in the future to know what the numbers are, where, uh, what your target weight is, um, and being able to, for someone to go off to college and step on a scale in a gym and be able to see where, you know, to make sure they stay in their weight range. Um, we externalize the eating disorder to distinguish, to really work on distinguishing between those problematic thoughts and beliefs and um, the healthy thoughts and beliefs. Um, and the, the, the evidence-based approaches you see here on the left actually don't necessarily involve the use of all of these medical providers, but best practices do include a multidisciplinary treatment team. Um, with at the very least a therapist, dietitian, and physician, uh, which is I think the case for for most of the issues that you all discuss here in Echo. Uh, so I have some resources for Northeast Ohio. So there are a lot of obviously outpatient providers who can treat eating disorders. If you're making referrals, I would recommend that you. Um, find someone who does focus or specialize or has training in eating disorders and um, 
in addition to that, there are higher level of care programs. I know Akron Children's just added an IOP program, and I believe they have plans to add a partial hospitalization. Um, a lot of the hospitals, so Columbus and Akron Children's have um, inpatient medical stabilization for eating disorders, but there's no therapy offered there. So they move from those treatment programs um, for bradycardia is an, or protein calorie malnutrition to um, a psychologically based program. The EMILY program did buy the Center for Balanced Living in Columbus, and they actually do offer adolescent residential treatment. So when we work with these kids, a lot of times we're referring them to higher levels of care and the residential is out of state. Um, there's a few programs in Pittsburgh. We send kids to Denver a lot, also uh, Rogers in Wisconsin. Um, ERC acquired Lindner Center in Cincinnati, but that's also, um, and they no longer have residential there, but not for adolescents. So it's, and it's a, a big burden for families to be able to travel for treatment, even just for the higher levels of care. Uh, so we, you know, these are populations where we use a lot of, do a lot of IEPs at school and um, uh, FMLA paperwork for parents. And um, that's a, a very brief overview of some of the family issues. Outside of anorexia, uh, there, there is insight often with other eating disorders without the significant weight loss and spiral of the malnutrition to the brain. And so your clinicians are, are more easily able to work on tracking and identifying emotional triggers, working. You can use um, CBT, a lot of DBT is helpful, skills-based work, um, tracking and, and the like. But with anorexia, because of what happens to the brain, the family is it's just necessary to have caregivers involved um, and then often a medical team um, and uh, often the school system as well. So I'll stop there and uh, kind of open up if you guys have any questions. <laughs>